Halo Combat Evolved is one of the most legendary games of all time. It's credited with launching a console and a company onto gaming's front stage. It modernized the first-person shooter as we see it, with its design, controls, and combat still being ripped to this very day. But is it really a near-perfect masterpiece? I've never stopped to think why this series has taken away so many hours of my very unproductive life, and judging by the majority of reviews out there, neither has anyone else. Nearly everything I read about the original game, regardless of when it was written, is about how amazing it is with nothing to challenge that opinion. But today, that's about to change. It's easy to forget now, but Halo's development was a chaotic and problematic cycle. Jason Jones, the co-founder of Bungie Studios, Halo's developer, said in his last days of making the game that it was like a cathedral self-assembling out of a hurricane. Trapped in pre-production for two years, the game was originally going to be a science fiction reskin of Bungie's very successful Myst series of strategy games, before being turned into a third-person action game and in the last half of development, a console-exclusive first-person shooter. Despite genre shifts, acquirement by Microsoft, and balancing three separate studios, Halo was available as a launch title for Microsoft's debuting console on November 15th, 2001. I didn't play the original Halo until 2006. By then, everything from Call of Duty to Gears of War had taken cues from Halo's design. But looking back on the status of gaming in 2001, it's easy to see why. In the 1990s, PC and console games were in radically different states. Today's industry has gone out of its way to unify multi-platform titles, but back then, games were rarely released for both platforms. Games that were released for PC and console often resulted in two different games with the same name. 2001 didn't make much progress, with many ports of successful PC shooters coming to the PlayStation 2. In fact, released only a day after the Xbox's launch, Half-Life was re-released on Sony's console. One of its added features was a lock-on button. Many games of the time were still using Rare's N64 GoldenEye as a template for console shooters due to its success. Thing is, Rare only made GoldenEye the way it was because of Nintendo's hideous controller. Dual analog sticks became a standard of this new generation of consoles, but no one believed that it was possible to make a PC-quality shooter with the limited aiming speeds of gamepads. Bungie ignored this myth and set about removing many of the console shooting staples. Snapping reticles, stiff controls, and tiny character models were a thing of the past. Part of the reason I think so many reviewers don't go into much detail about Halo's gameplay is that a lot of it has to do with feel, which is difficult to describe. It's a refined mixture of elements. Auto-aim is subtle, weapons are inaccurate, enemies stand both tall and wide, and your character has three separate ways of quickly inflicting damage. All of these systems come together to make a fast and aggressive game, but one that isn't so twitchy a gamepad is unable to keep up with the action. This is why PC shooters released for the Dreamcast and PlayStation 2 haven't aged well. Small character models combined with precise weapons and a high speed of movement simply isn't enjoyable with analog sticks versus computer mice. There's no doubt that being restricted to a console is what made Bungie focus on nailing the controls and designing their gameplay with the platform in mind. Halo used its science fiction setting to experiment with new mechanics, and that is where the regenerating shields come from. Misused by many games today, the system enhances Halo's pacing and to compensate for the size of its outdoor environments. Enemy encounters in Halo are frequent. Squads of Covenant will typically fire at you in sync. I'd estimate that the damage you take in single encounters isn't above average, but the amount of damage you take over long periods of time is enormous. Had this game used a standard health bar, the amount of medkits required in a stage would be asinine. This would also restrict the player to searching for health instead of exploring the level at their leisure. Health packs are very important in Combat Evolved, and become mandatory on Legendary difficulty, but the fixed amount of damage your energy shields absorb keeps battles intense without interference. 
They also humanize the Master Chief. When shields are drained, this playable super soldier is an exposed human being on the verge of death. The Master Chief is mostly a 7 foot tall brick, but as a construct for the player, he has a shared vulnerability, making him more relatable and in the process, more likable. Continuing the tradition of ignoring trends, Halo restricted the player to carrying only two firearms. Halo is not a realistic game by any stretch of the imagination, but this was seen as a revolution when contrasted with the likes of Duke Nukem and Quake. As with energy shields, this feature has been misused today, but Halo is a great example of how it works as intended. I previously mentioned how most weapons feature a generous crosshair, making it easy to shoot targets, but even these weapons have a large number of variables. The assault rifle and plasma rifle may seem like the human and alien equivalents of each other, but even these two weapons have differences in terms of fire rate, damage to shields and health, projectile speed, and ammunition. This is seen across every weapon available in the game. The pistol and assault rifle given at the very beginning are two of the most reliable. The pistol is great at taking down enemies from medium range, and the assault rifle is excellent at clearing out squads of grunts. Every time the player selects a weapon, the commitment is made, and how it combines with their use of grenades and melee attacks also factors into the player's decisions. It's a great system that encourages people to experiment with weapons instead of discarding most of the arsenal. Up to a point. Halo does have a bad habit of providing weapons for specific battles. When you enter a section with vehicles, you can be assured that a rocket launcher will be conveniently placed for your explosive needs. This is also true for almost every encounter with hunters, either by supplying overshields or placing a dead marine with the almighty pistol. But convenient weapons are a minor flaw. Far more frustrating is a lack of resources. These situations aren't an issue on normal or even heroic difficulty, but on legendary it becomes a massive pain in the ass. Sections with little to no cover become more about what the AI does instead of the player. The player's survival is measured by luck instead of skill, something that Halo generally avoids, making it worse when it happens. However, the greatest flaw of the weapon system is when you meet these guys. The Flood are a neat idea on paper, and they're important to Halo's story, but aren't fun to fight. Even when the game isn't subjecting you to repeating hallways and endless corridors, the Flood tactics have exactly two modes. Stand around firing a bullet every two weeks, or leap at you like a starving lion on the moon. Because of these two modes, you only need two guns to make your dealings with them a breeze. The shotgun and the pistol. Both of which are supplied with every five steps when the Flood are introduced. But overall, I'd say that this system is still great in the game's first half. If it wasn't, games wouldn't be copying it to this day. Shooters of the 1990s often limited their level design to narrow corridors and interiors, primarily because the technology for rendering large 3D environments with convincing detail wasn't available. 2001 featured a plethora of games beginning to change this on PC. Titles such as Ghost Recon, Operation Flashpoint, Serious Sam, and Tribes 2. Further ignoring console trends, Halo was credited with bringing large levels in a first-person shooter to consoles. The first level taking place on Halo is beloved by many, and I think for good reason. Halo does an excellent job contrasting the level with the game's opening. The campaign begins with classic spaceship corridors, an environment gamers were familiar with. This comfortable space allows the player to become used to the enemy AI before taking the training wheels off and expanding the levels. Everything changes upon landing on this mysterious ring world. The game is linear, but this level is a far cry from the claustrophobic hallways of Bungie's previous shooter, Marathon. Each of Halo's six levels are distinct, ranging from lush green forests, snow-covered canyons, and ancient underground tunnels. Even better, the game includes vehicles that seamlessly transition into a third-person perspective. Sadly, just as with the weapon system, it's not perfect. The larger levels are great, except when you're at the mercy of the awful checkpoint system. Halo seems to have fixed checkpoint locations in each stage, but it's coupled with a system that determines whether or not the player is safe. What the game's system determines to be safe is often questionable, and if you're moving too quickly through a stage, the game often won't activate a checkpoint you move past, meaning that if you get killed, you'll potentially lose 15 to 20 minutes of progress. But Halo's worst level design isn't found in the outdoors. 
It appears in the form of copy-paste rooms and infect three stages. Assault on Control Room, the Library, and two Betrayals. Halo's dynamic combat system is excellent and holds up even by modern standards, but the number of repeated rooms and Assault on Control Room borders on insanity. Entertainment often relies on the rule of threes and video game design is no exception. Assault on Control Room takes it too far. This square room is repeated nine times throughout the level, with three bridges and two connecting hallways in between. To make things worse, Two Betrayals has you backtrack through each of these all over again, with an enemy that is less enjoyable to fight. But if we're going to talk about repetitive, the library cannot go unmentioned. I recently played through the game twice, once with the Master Chief Collection on Legendary, and once again with the original Xbox game on Heroic, and each time I was very tempted to just skip the level entirely. Moving through a seemingly endless stream of hallways is bad enough, but to pad the runtime of the stage even more, you're locked into a room fending off waves of enemies until your lightbulb friend opens a door. Sound familiar? Storytelling has never been the strength of first-person shooters. The holy trinity of Influence, System Shock, Thief, and Deus Ex were monumental improvements compared to the likes of Doom and Duke. But with the exception of Thief, neither were well known for their presentation, cinematography, or polish. Oh my god, JC, a bomb! A bomb! bomb, 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 bomb. This is why I think so many people gave Halo credit for its storytelling even if it was unwarranted. The filming of the cinematics, the solid voice acting, and excellent score elevate Halo's ultimately mediocre narrative above the average action title. Why do I say mediocre? Well, because it's a narrative that doesn't hold up very well under scrutiny, and its characters, while distinct, aren't very layered. For example, let's return to Assault on Control Room. By this point in the game, the player is close to learning what this ring world is really for. All they know by this point is that the Covenant believe it to be a weapon. Cortana is thrilled at the prospect of accessing Halo's control center when suddenly she becomes pessimistic and tells the Chief to run and find Captain Keys without explaining why. Also, the way Chief runs away in this scene is pretty funny. Get out of here, find keys, and stop And I love the Chief's yeah. animation there. And he like starts oh, running oh, away oh. before he even knows what he's doing. <laughs> I'm going, I'm doing it. I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm going. <laughs> uh, the glowy lady said to go. It's demonstrated early on with Cartana's sarcastic dialogue that AIs in Halo are not the monotone drones populating science fiction. Cortana's personality is likable and it makes sense in the game's world as she's based on Dr. Halsey, the woman responsible for Spartans such as the Master Chief. But this doesn't explain Cortana's emotional instability here. There's no reason that she can't at least give Master Chief a small clue as to why he needs to find Captain Keys. From a writer's perspective, it's obvious. The flutter meant to be the big twist and Cortana explaining what Chief will stumble upon would ruin the initial surprise but a good twist ties in naturally with the character's actions. This doesn't. Speaking of the twist, my feelings on it are conflicted. As a 12-year-old kid, this level was one of Halo's highlights with its creepy atmosphere and terrifying reveal of the Flood. Playing this mission today, I can't help but feel it's rather on the side of boring. The tight corridors and copy-paste rooms don't make for very interesting gameplay, and the twist doesn't have an impact on me anymore. It's entirely possible that I've played through the game enough times to become completely desensitized to the Flood, but it can also be because everything's better when you're 12. I appreciate how the developers set up the reveal, with subtle foreshadowing, distinct music, and a unique perspective from a Marine's video recording. Unfortunately, when the Flood bursts through the doors, it doesn't really do anything for me. As said before, the Flood are so easy to fight against that they don't feel like much of a threat during gameplay, even when the story tells us that they're supposed to be. This reveal is what closes the game's first half and kicks off the second, but if you ask me, this is when the game's quality starts to decay. The ending of this level is when we meet our fourth and final plot-related character, 343 Guilty Spark, and are introduced to what at first appear to be allies known as the Sentinels. I honestly forgot how jarring this scene is. 
four lines of dialogue in 20 seconds introduces a new character, a fourth faction, a new goal for the player, and the ability to teleport from any location on the planet. It's clear that by this point, the plot is being cobbled together out of the levels that exist. The library is the game's final original environment, with the final levels just being Assault and Control Room, The Truth and Reconciliation, and The Pillar of Autumn played in reverse order. Bungie are a talented studio, and it's impossible that this was their ideal conclusion for the game's third act. Once the double twist that Halo wipes out all sentient life in the galaxy and not just the Flood is revealed, the plot mostly consists of hand-waving and contrivance. Shutting down systems with an EMP pulse using your suit's energy shields is already laughable, but the game goes on to explain teleportation. It turns out that Halo has an entire teleportation grid unknown to Cortana until now, and your shields are also able to power it. Pull it from your suit? Only once. Well, why is that joke? So how are you going to like distract people from saying, why haven't you been using this method of transportation this whole time? Let me just say the time? worst cinematic in the game, which is what we just saw, <laughs> is actually book. Halo storytelling may have been an improvement compared to other first-person shooters, but when compared to the likes of Thief the Dark Project, Deus Ex, Metal Gear Solid, Grim Fandango, Fallout, Baldur's Gate, System Shock, Max Payne, Silent Hill, Planescape Torment, Longest Journey, the story itself isn't very good. But as I said earlier, the presentation is what's impressive here, not the story it's presenting, if that makes any sense. For all its epic music, large-scale battles, and Save the Galaxy plot, Halo doesn't take itself too seriously, and that's what saves it. Oh, I see. The coordinate data needs to be... Right. Sorry. Characters such as Sergeant Johnson and Guilty Spark are examples of this. The sergeant appears multiple times during the game's first half, even if you see him die in a previous stage. And the Guilty Spark will fly around talking to himself about how much of a genius he is. The game is having fun, and that's ultimately Halo's goal. But that doesn't mean the game can't occasionally have a sense of melancholy, but I would attribute it entirely to the game's score and not the story. Marty O'Donnell is already one of gaming's icons, and I don't want to inflate the man's ego for the rest of this video, but his work on this game is excellent, and it lays the groundwork for even better soundtracks to emerge. Upon replaying this game, I was a little disappointed that the use of Marty's score hadn't been more appropriately edited. Each song composed has a purpose, but many of them get reused throughout the campaign, which cheapens their effect. Neutralize the generator, but it will also drain your shields and leave you vulnerable until they recharge. Cortana to Echo 419. Two Covenant Banshees are approaching on your six. Evade! Say again, evade! I'm hit! Halo 1's multiplayer is an interesting subject. According to the documentary, O Brave New World, its existence was only made possible by the Oni team. Bungie had three studios working on different projects until all three of them merged to complete Halo in time for the Xbox's launch. Needless to say, multiplayer was an afterthought, something that hadn't been planned from the get-go. It's impressive then that this game's multiplayer portion is as much fun as it is. I'll be upfront in admitting that I never played any of Halo 1's multiplayer before the Master Chief Collection, unless you count Halo PC, a port with latency so pathetic it's rather embarrassing I used to play it regularly. While I have hundreds, perhaps even thousands of hours logged onto Halo's multiplayer across every game, I'd say that about 10 of them have been spent on Halo 1 in the Master Chief Collection. 
Halo 1's multiplayer could be described as the most pure iteration of the game. Customization options are limited compared to its sequels. Auto-aim is less forgiving. Power-ups and power weapons spawn frequently at a fixed rate, and it has the fastest deaths, thanks to everyone's secondary weapon. That's crazy. The pistol is rather infamous in gaming circles as one of the most overpowered handguns in gaming. To suggest that this weapon isn't your primary would be dishonest, as it's always the first thing players switch to when they respawn. In the campaign, it's actually not that great against some of the game's tougher elites due to their high shield capacity. Multiplayer, however, as most people know, it's a three-shot kill if you can aim well enough. Double. I know that some people absolutely despise us about Halo 1, and understandably so. Many players are going to be put off by the fact that a pistol is capable of killing so quickly. I'm more accepting of it. The pistol in Halo 1 is capable of killing in 3 shots, but an average level player isn't going to be accurate enough to kill this quickly. Only the most highly skilled players will be able to pull it off consistently. The pistol is Halo 1's Jack of All Trades Master of None weapon that would later be replaced by the battle rifle. It's not as good in close range as the assault rifle, and it's not as good at long range as the sniper rifle. Every firearm, including power weapons, requires leading your shots on moving targets in this game. As a result, most battles in Halo 1 are fast but tense due to how quickly tables can turn for either combatant. Someone who trigger fingers the pistol may draw first blood, but if the enemy is timing their shots more accurately, they will come out on top. This is a pillar that exists in all iterations of Halo's multiplayer, and it's impressive that Bungie founded this despite their time constraints. Aside from non-hitscan weapons, the two things that are most unique about Halo 1's multiplayer compared to its sequels are how it handles timers and spawns. Every item in a level is set to a fixed timer that will respawn the item regardless of when it's been picked up. If the rocket launcher has only been picked up 10 seconds before it's been set to spawn again, there is no postponing the timer. A new set of rockets will respawn no matter what. This is something exclusive to Combat Evolved until Halo 5 is released. What results is a game that despite its slower pace in terms of movement speed, is faster in terms of map and power control. Two teams with power weapons is a lot more frequent and adds tension, knowing that the enemy may wield the same power weapon as yourself. Just as important as weapon control is spawn control, and that's where we talk about Halo's unique system. Later games in the series seem to combine the locations of your allies and enemies and where firefights are taking place on the map to determine where to spawn you. Halo 1 only cares about your teammates. Maps have a small number of spawns, and more often than not, you'll be within a few feet of your ally, unless he or she purposefully blocks your spawn, causing it to be randomized. I seem to recall a few competitive players defending this system, and it's easy to see why. Players of a high skill level will be able to predict where enemies and teammates will spawn, adding another layer to the game's strategy. But I feel that this system is just too easy to exploit and often results in one team having an unfair advantage. A system that allows people to spawn directly in combat Quake 3 style is indefensible. Multiplayer should punish mistakes, but in this situation, one team are earning free kills with little effort. Finally, I'll discuss map selection. Halo 1's maps are very simple, another reminder that multiplayer in this game had been tacked on. Simple isn't bad though, and I'd say that Halo's maps are very solid, especially since half of them have been remade countless times. Thing is, I can't help but feel that most of the remakes are better. As said previously, I have the least experience with Halo 1's multiplayer. It's possible that I'm not used to Halo 1's pace after playing Halo 2's Beaver Creek hundreds of times. But I'd argue that many of the remakes brought improvements and refinements. Removing annoyances such as slippery movement on uneven surfaces, ladders, and fall damage. There's also maps that are so bad they're not available in any of the Master Chief Collection's playlists. Big Team Battle Maps and Halo 1 are the weakest of the series. Blood Gulch is fun and a Halo staple, but I've always been baffled when I hear so many people claim it to be the greatest map in the entire franchise. Sidewinder is also good, but nothing to write home about. And the big team battle maps that Gearbox added for taking advantage of online capabilities in Halo PC are terrible, with Timberland being the only solid map from it. Everything else is a lazy assortment of campaign levels retooled for multiplayer. 
Dumb fun can be had, but matches go on for far too long and games quickly boil down to spawn camping an enemy base. Oh my god, I literally drove forward. Taken all together, I'd say that at its best, Halo 1's multiplayer is great and has unique qualities that set it apart from its successors. But at its worst, the game can be utterly infuriating, and it's the least forgiving when it comes to multiplayer. The highs are high, and the lows are low. Halo has four versions available. Halo Combat Evolved for the original Xbox, the PC port released by Gearbox in 2003, Anniversary for Xbox 360, and Anniversary Bundled in the Master Chief Collection for the X-Bone. The original game still holds up very well. Graphics are dated and the frame rate can dip down into single digits when things get hectic, but never often enough to ruin the experience. Halo PC is the same game, just with a mouse and keyboard. This port wasn't brilliantly optimized at the time, but for computers of today, it's a breeze. Higher resolution and frame rates are available, as well as very fast load times. Anniversary for the Xbox 360 is one of the more successful HD re-releases available. Saber Interactive were brought in to update Combat Evolved with modern generation textures, lighting, and graphics, even including a remastered version of the game's soundtrack. It looks good, but this is where I begin to feel like a bitter old man, because I honestly prefer the original graphics and sounds. It appears to be that Saber Interactive attempted to weave the art style of Halo Reach into Anniversary, an admirable goal since Reach is the prequel to Combat Evolved, but I can't help but feel the environments just don't echo the atmosphere of the originals. The best example I can give is the level 343 Guilty Spark, in the original game, the level was built to feel like a swamp, but in Anniversary, it's been turned into a rainforest. Ancient Forerunner structures that had an aura of natural decay now look like they've been polished by unknown servants before Master Chief's arrival. And the brightness of these environments destroys all sense of fear and mystique. From a technical perspective, I think Saber Interactive did an impressive job updating the graphics while being restricted to using what was, at the time, 10-year-old code. But in their attempt of keeping things consistent between later games and Anniversary, they've ironically made a more inconsistent experience. The remastered score and retooled sound effects for weapons such as the pistol and shotgun don't add anything and appear out of place when used along with the original sound effects. These minor annoyances are ultimately negligible, and the remastered soundtrack and visuals are easily replaceable with the originals. Anniversary on Xbox One is the same remaster, only with a higher frame rate and resolution. And annoying loading screens that infest everything in the MCC. I understand I'm scraping the bottom of the barrel, but hear me out. Remember how great it was stepping out onto Halo for the first time. Now imagine if just before that happened, a picture of the environment you were about to see appeared in a loading screen. It would have less of an impact. I understand that the Master Chief Collection was intended for fans, but I know that many people new to a franchise enjoy collections so they can easily play through everything on one disc, and I can't help but feel that these loading screens would diminish the initial intrigue of the Halo Ring world for first-time players. Still, it's nice to play the game at 60 frames a second. It's amazing to me how much Destiny hasn't improved in terms of its core shooting and movement from Combat Evolved. Halo was decades ahead of its time, and it's easy to see why it's credited with modernizing the first-person shooter. I adore games like Perfect Dark and Time Splitters, but they are games that show their age. What's staggering about Halo is just how playable it is to this day. I've played many games in the last 10 years with worse control and less dynamic combat than Halo. Even the studio behind it has only made tweaks to the formula over the years. Age isn't what hurts Halo by today's standards. What does are the decisions made due to a lack of sufficient time. After two playthroughs, I'm completely sick of some of the levels in this game. The story is also pretty mediocre when you get past the great music and Cortana's dialogue. And things such as the checkpoint system can make for some rage-inducing moments. What impressed me most about Halo 1 is the attention to detail. Marines reacting to you landing high jumps in a warthog. Grunts fleeing from battle if you kill their elite commander. Grenades causing chain reactions. The blood and shield effects when enemies are taking damage. 
dialogue that accounts for the order you accomplish objectives in. These genuinely add to Halo's gameplay sandbox, and some can be utilized strategically by the player. In many ways, it's what sets Halo apart. Whereas other developers would be content with just finishing a game, Bungie spent time and effort polishing these details, greatly improving the experience when it all comes together. During a time when shooters were typically met with corridors and scripted AI, Halo went above and beyond, and brought us a dynamic and modern game that still holds up today, even if it's not the masterpiece we thought it once was.